Thank you, Robin Susan. That's awesome. Okay. We are continuing our series in Romans today, and we are starting off with Romans 2:17 to 29. I will read it. It's a mouthful, so bear with me. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. When I was a teenager, I was really into death metal music. I still am, mind you, but back then it was my life. I had the long hair and the black clothes and all that. I looked like it. I decided fairly young that I wanted to learn to play guitar. I wanted to shred and be on stage and headbang with the long hair. Not everything about that has changed, but when I first picked up the instrument, I tried to launch right into playing really quickly. I would play random notes as fast as possible. I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that it sounded like a cat in a wood chipper. It was terrible. It has no form or value. There's no musicality to it. There's no framework. It's like li listening to someone just screaming wildly and calling it singing. Eventually, I was politely informed by my fellow peers that it was like nails on chalkboard. I had to learn scales, whatever those were. And I got good at playing those scales eventually. I practiced and practiced and practiced over and over and over again. The same eight notes over and over and over again. Same eight notes. I understood, I understood what a fourth and a fifth was. I knew what a tritone was. I had all these musical terms in my head. I felt that I had finally gotten it. But when I would try and write music or show off my skills to people, I was told that it was painfully robotic. My playing had no feel or spirit or emotion. It was useless. You can't play any songs by just doing a scale over and over again. In a similar fashion, you can't have a relationship with God by just playing the scales repeatedly. That's not how it works. The scales are a nice framework so you can know what works and what doesn't. Music or enjoys music knows the last thing music should be is robotic. This is how the religious leaders of Jesus' day treated their relationship with Yahweh. Scales. Good enough, right? But of course not. The law, like the scales, are a nice framework so we can know what works and what doesn't in the eyes of God. It doesn't provide any freedom or relationship or genuine love. This can be applied with really any type of law, not just Old Testament law. We don't get our quality of life from the fact that murder or breaking and entering is illegal. You could pick any civilization in any point in history and this is the case. We don't get our freedom from the fact that laws exist. Our quality of life is God-given, not law-given. The law is not there to save, but to condemn. Now, we've had revolution after revolution in human history. 
time and time again to fix what we would see as injustices against this God-given quality of life. To right the wrongs, often committed at the hands of some elite class. And that sounds really nice and, and pacifying for us, but it looms behind us as we recall that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are not different in this regard, not really. But this is only a threat to those who go about it unaware of the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. To the rest of us, it is a warning and hopeful relief of grace through faith. The last necessary revolution was 2,000 years ago. Not 3,000 years ago, around when the Jews got their law, mind you. Again, the law does not set us free, but condemns us all. It was the crucifixion that saved us. Paul anticipates this question. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. In this way, the law is indeed binding, whether people obey it or not, in that there is no excuse for being unaware of sin. But the religious leaders of Paul's day treated it like a checklist, which is a theme often repeated through the Old Testament prophets. You could say the same about our elite class today. They completely, sometimes deliberately, miss the point of the law. The Jews did not repeatedly forget Yahweh only because they weren't following the law. They forsook a relationship with him in favor of crossing their T's and dotting their I's. It would be like me counting how many times I took communion or prayed, or even worse, it would be like if I counted how many times I did that and compared it to how many times all of you did that. The inevitable result of this is not just sin, but a dependence on our own righteousness. And that twisted me the wrong way. It twisted me the wrong way when I wrote that, because I know I do this. And not only do I do this, and not only does everybody here do this, everybody in the world does this, within or without faith. We cross the T's and dot the I's, because then we can justify everything else that we can do. Jewish law, like any law, becomes twisted inwardly and for the benefit of the self. And at its core, it's only practiced selfishly. This is called legalism. And the truth is that when they, whether first century Jews or the elite class of the modern day, are confronted with this notion, they meet it with apathy, usually. It doesn't matter to them because to them it is just some checklist, and they're the ones that run the show. As long as the boxes are checked, it doesn't matter. That's when the law becomes idolatry and self-righteousness becomes idolatry. Okay. Let's say a doctor had a particularly good week. He saves four lives Monday to Friday. That's not bad. That's pretty good. Four lives Monday to Friday saved. That's really good. But he goes home and murders his wife. He is, of course, arrested, and he's brought to trial, and he stands before a righteous judge. Now, what's the score here? It's four to one. That's not bad, right? That's pretty good. Four lives saved, one life lost. That's okay, right? No. The righteous judge sends him to jail for the rest of his life because you can't murder people. That's not, you can't do that. It doesn't matter how much good you do. You can't murder people. Here's where the Christian culture deviates hard from the culture of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The law does not save, but condemns. On a side note, this is also why the concept of karma in Eastern religions doesn't make sense. If God is righteous, then God has to judge darkness. And if God judges darkness, you don't get a pass because of your works, right? That's why the Bible says that our works are like filthy rags. It doesn't matter at all. In Romans 2, Paul writes, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law... Paul reiterating, of course, that the law does convey God's will and excellency. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, 
a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? This is, of course, a rhetorical question. Paul is perfectly aware through personal experience that the answer is no. Those who represent the law do not teach themselves. Paul proceeds with more rhetorical questions. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? What Paul is trying to convey is this. While the law is good and just and holy, it was not meant as a checklist. It was conveyed to recognize our sin. He was conveying that the law is nothing without heart and love, and that these sins would be extinguished only when it is approached with heart and love and relationship, not legalism. And the elite Jews, having the hardened hearts Paul knew they had, again through experience, were told this, you dishonor God by breaking the law. And quoting Isaiah, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. What these representatives of the law missed was not only the heart and the love, but the justice. The Pharisees and Sadducees thought themselves above this. Because they taught the law and were the chosen representatives, they were immune to God's gavel. Now, fortunately for us, the penalty was given to Christ on our behalf. And if we depend on this law not only to recognize sin, excuse me, if we depend on this law not to recognize sin, but to gain favor from peers, then we have no relationship with him. We render the crucifixion and resurrection as useless to us. And we do this all the time. I do this all the time. I did do this all the time. I still do with pastors and priests all the time, holding them in high regard, even beyond what the Bible actually teaches. This is where we are at risk of idolatry towards religious leaders, even our own. I catch myself sometimes listening to Paul Washer on YouTube instead of reading the Bible or listening to Vody Bauckham or any of these famous preachering, right? It doesn't matter if it's Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox. Everybody can fall into this trap. Now, Steph is a great pastor, but how do you think Pastor Steph would react if we all started considering him a Jedi Bible guru or like a master scripture interpreter and we depended on him entirely? If he was a good pastor, and he is, he would be the first to call us out on that. And he would, I asked him. <laughs> Lastly, Paul fires at one of the core components of who the Jews are at the end of the chapter circumcision. This was their identifier. It was foundational to being a Jew, and it was the mark of the covenant with God. Now, by the time Paul wrote Romans, he had been in probably a thousand arguments with Orthodox Jews regarding this. What's better is he actually knew the playbook. He had probably made these arguments himself a thousand times when he was persecuting the church. Okay, so let's focus on the word covenant in that context. Paul writes, Circumcision indeed is of value, but only if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. In other words, circumcision was not a fulfiller of the covenant, but a reminder of it. It was an act of obedience. Again, not a box to check to make sure you do well enough. John MacArthur wrote in one of his commentaries, a Jew who continually transgressed God's law, had no more of a saving relationship to God than an uncircumcised Gentile. The outward symbol was nothing without the inner reality. This was true in Old Testament and New Testament times. It actually doesn't matter. It's always been grace through faith, every single time. Paul continues, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And there are those words that are so often repeated, inward, a matter of the heart, by the Spirit. The law does not save, but condemns. The saving comes from the gift of the Holy Spirit, given to us by God. The law doesn't actually have anything to do with that. This is a continuous theme throughout the entire Bible. Again, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament too. If it was about genetics, as many of the Jews thought, and many of them still think, the Old Testament would have failed to convey real reality. But, of course, it didn't. There are plenty of Gentile converts all throughout the Old Testament. There's even some listed in Jesus' genealogy, uh, like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba. 
And indeed, in the words of God himself, if a stranger shall journey with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. And you shall treat the stranger who journeys with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Finally, John the Baptist drives this home right to their faces at the Euphrates River. And do not think and say in yourselves, Abraham is, your fa- is our father. For I say to you, God can raise up from these stones children to Abraham. And he did raise up children of Abraham. God's chosen people are revealed as such inwardly. They are known by the spirit and by the heart. They play the music with the heart and by the spirit with a good foundation of scales and not just vain repetition. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, your word um, today. Um, Thank you for this congregation and uh, the opportunity to preach at them, Lord. Um, I pray a blessing over their lives. I pray that you keep them under your wings always, Lord. And I pray for their well-being and um, for, in necessary situations, their discipline. In Jesus' name, amen.